spore-forming bacteria, that it produces toxins, it produces several toxins, but the most important are toxins A and B, and these are what actually cause the disease, which can range from mild diarrhea to colitis to the most severe form of pseudomembranous colitis and can cause death. <clears throat> And there's been a marked increase in the number and severity of cases since the year 2000 that's correlated with the emergence of a hypervirulent strain that's called either NAP1 or BI or 027, and that depends on the different typing systems that are used to name that strain. So since the year 2000, epidemics have been reported in the United States, in Canada, especially in Quebec, where they have had thousands of deaths, in Europe and Japan. And this hypervirulent strain is unusual in that it has a gene deletion in the, in the gene that regulates toxin production. And so rather than having normal regulation of toxin production, this organism can produce 20 to 30 times more toxin in vitro. And we presume that that's what's happening in humans as well. In addition, it has quinolone and clindamycin resistance. And in this diagram here, you can see that with normal toxin production from a non-NAP1 strain, the uh, levels of toxin are relatively low, but with this um, gene mutation, the organism produces 20 to 30 times more toxin, and that may be why it is so virulent. But let's go back over 100 years to 1893, when the first case of pseudomembranous colitis was reported. This was a 22-year-old woman, and she had had three months of nausea and vomiting. She was malnourished. She was examined by Sir William Osler, and just like in academic medicine today, he then left town and was not involved in her care <laughs> later. She had on exam a dilated stomach with a palpable mass, and at surgery she had a cicatrizing pyloric ulcer that they operated on, and then they treated her postoperatively with enemas of saline and whiskey, which we can only assume was standard of care at that time. Ten days after her surgery, she developed diarrhea, then tenesmus, the diarrhea became bloody, and five days after that, she died. And at the autopsy, they described diphtheritic colitis. I thought about putting in a slide of diphtheria, since none of us have actually seen diphtheria in the back of the throat, but I think we all remember the pictures from medical school. And so this is perhaps what they would have seen if they had been doing colonoscopy in those days. Maybe she had these discrete pseudomembranes here, or maybe she had these confluent pseudomembranes here, and these are from cases that we've seen in Harborview. Histologically, it probably would have looked like this, a relatively preservation, normal preservation of the colonic architecture, but this thick pseudomembrane covering the mucosa. The pseudomembrane is composed of fibrin and polys and debris, and it's actually attached to the colon. It actually erupts from the colon mucosa in this slide from a different biopsy, and you can actually see that this pseudomembrane is attached and erupting from the mucosa in what's called the summit or volcano lesion. Well, obviously, they didn't have antibiotics in 1893, so why did she have pseudomembranous colitis? I think because she had a very abnormal microbiome in her colon. She had uh, GI tract disease, which would change the flora. She had GI tract surgery, and then I'm sure the alcohol enemas had a profound effect on the normal microbiota. So these days, the most common risk factors are having been on antibiotics, especially in the last two months, and especially broad-spectrum antibiotics and multiple antibiotics. Being in the hospital or being in a long-term care facility, being over 65, comorbid conditions, and being immunosuppressed. But in the last 10 years, there actually are some newly recognized risk factors. There are more cases of community-acquired C. difficile, so more outpatients that are otherwise pretty healthy are getting C. difficile infection. There's a definite increase in C. diff in our patients with inflammatory bowel disease, and when they get C. diff, they're sicker than the patients either with C. diff alone or IBD alone, and they're more likely to die and more likely to need an urgent colectomy. And then finally, the literature looking at the association of proton pump inhibitors with C. difficile has been somewhat mixed over the last 10 years. But some recent meta-analyses really favor an association of PPIs with acquiring C. difficile infection. So here's my goal for this morning, and that's to answer four questions. What are the best diagnostic tests for C. difficile infection? How do I choose the appropriate therapy for my patients with C. diff? When should I get a surgery consult? And how do I treat patients with recurrent C. diff? So let's start with the best diagnostic test for C. difficile. So diagnostic testing results on detection of toxin in the stools. 
However, the tests are imperfect and they also have changed. And one important point is if you're going to test patients, only send diarrheal stools to the lab because about 80% of infants can be carriers and, and uh, C. diff infection in babies is very unusual. We don't know why. We think maybe they don't have the receptor for the toxin. But 5 to 15% of adults are also carriers and especially people who have been in the hospital. So just test diarrheal stools. So these are the diagnostic tests that uh, I'll review. The toxigenic culture, so that's checking for whether or not the organism actually produces toxin because there are many strains of C. difficile and those that don't produce toxin don't make you sick. Toxin, cyto, cytotoxin B in tissue culture was the old gold standard and was the first diagnostic test that we actually had. Both of these tests take 24 to 48 hours for the results to come back, so they're not really helpful for us as clinicians, but they are useful for microbiologists as reference tests so that they can look at the accuracy of other tests. The enzyme immunoassay tests were widely used in the 2000s. A GDH antigen is a clostridial antigen, which has been used as a screen, and then polymerase chain reaction detecting the gene for toxin B. So the EIA test, our hospitals actually used to use only a toxin A test, and that will miss a few percent of strains that produce toxin B but don't produce toxin A. So many hospitals then used to doing an EIA test for toxins A and B. And these are sensitive, but they're not very specific, and they should not, at this point, be standalone tests. GDH is a very popular test. This is a common antigen, glutamate dehydrogenase. It's a clostridial antigen, but it's not specific for clostridium difficile. So if it's there, your patient might have C. diff, but they might have some other clostridium. So it's very sensitive, but it's not specific. So some labs like to use this as a screen. Meaning, they'll start with the GDH. If that's negative, they won't do any further testing. If it's positive, then they have to do some sort of a confirmatory testing, and that uh, could be a PCR. Our lab has been, I think, at the forefront of developing PCR testing for toxin B, and I think was one of the early, uh, uh, early institutions to publish on the usefulness of PCR. This is a nucleic acid amplification test, and real-time PCR is what our lab does now. And it's expensive, but it's quick and it's accurate. And the literature suggests that actually, even though it's expensive, it'll probably save money in the long run because you're going to diagnose the cases earlier, treat them earlier, isolate them earlier. And so overall, hospital costs can be reduced. Peter uh, Gilligan at the University of North Carolina did an informal survey and shared these results with me. He surveyed university hospital labs at a recent microbiology meeting and determined that about the two-thirds of university hospital labs use PCR as a standalone test, as we do, and about one-third use the GDH screen with a PCR confirmatory because it's cheaper. However, remember that some community hospitals are still using an EIA test, so if you're practicing in that environment, remember the limitations of that test. Now, I used to say that rectal swabs were not useful, but a recent publication suggests that a rectal swab can be useful for PCR. So if your patient has an ileus and isn't producing any stool, and you need to know whether or not there's C. diff, then a rectal swab can be used. Don't routinely test three stools. The yield of a repeat is very, very low. So one stool test is all you need to do. And then finally, please don't test for cure, because culture and toxin can stay positive. If your patient doesn't have diarrhea, don't ask. Um, a final take-home point is I do think that PCR will be the new, if it is not already, the new gold standard. But remember, even PCR is not perfect. If your patient is sick and you think they might have C. diff, start empiric therapy. There's no harm in that. How do I choose appropriate therapy for my patient with C. difficile infection? Let's review what the choices are. There are three effective oral antibiotics, metronidazole at a dose of 500 milligrams three times a day for 10 days, vancomycin, 125 milligrams four times a day for 10 days, and fidaxomycin, 200 milligrams twice a day for 10 days. And vancomycin and fidaxomycin have both been FDA approved, although metronidazole is widely used. What is fidaxomycin? This has been available a little less than two years. It's a new class of antibiotic that's poorly absorbed, and it's felt to not change the uh, microbiome as much as other antibiotics done. In studies of mild to moderate C. diff infection, it was equivalent to vancomycin. 
the buzz about fidaxomycin is that in those studies, the patients treated with fidaxomycin had a lower rate of recurrence, 15% compared to 24% recurrence rates with vancomycin. This led the company to charge twice as much as vancomycin for this antibiotic. And remember, it has not been tested for severe C. diff or for recurrent C. diff. Has anybody here prescribed fidaxomycin? Was it worth it? Don't know. Here's a review of the costs. And I had a hard time finding the different costs because they vary so much. So I got a collation of University of Washington, um, uh, University of Pittsburgh, and uh, Northwest Hospital. So metronidazole orally is very inexpensive. $15 to $30 would be about an average cost. Vancomycin pills are about $1,000. Uh, However, vancomycin has recently come off patent even though the cost hasn't decreased, I'm expecting that it probably will if there's a generic form that's available. Northwest Hospital, as many institutions, can compound the IV form of vancomycin and give that orally. And the cost of that is anywhere from 40 to 300. Some places charge a little bit more. But you can see that that IV form given orally is a lot cheaper than the pills. And in the olden days, when we had shortages or lack of uh, oral vancomycin pills, that's what we used. And then you can see that fidaxomycin is uh, charged at almost $3,000, and the rates of that are quite variable as well. Because of this great cost differential, there is a, a strong suggestion that we start with metronidazole. So how do we determine then? So there are a number of different guidelines that suggest that we should determine the treatment based on how sick the patient is, which of course makes sense. So the three categories are mild to moderate, severe, and severe and complicated. And stay with me as I explain those because it's going to be a little bit backwards since mild to moderate is absence of severe and severe and complicated. The um, ID Society published, used this criteria in their guidelines, which are very good guidelines published a couple of years ago. I had the pleasure of working with a surgeon, a microbiologist, an infectious disease doc, and several gastroenterologists to develop guidelines for the American College of Gastroenterology on C. diff, and those are going to be published in the next few months. And I struggled to come up with a better definition because severe and complicated just seems a little bit unwieldy, and I'll confess, we just couldn't come up with anything better. We're then left with other things complicated. Do you mean fulminant? Do you mean refractory? So we're going to stick with the the classification system that the ID people came up with, but we've changed the criteria a little bit, I think, to make it a little bit more user friendly. So mild to moderate C. diff is di diarrhea without having any of the criteria for severe, which I haven't shown you yet. How do we determine what is diarrhea? A, a, a well-accepted definition of diarrhea is it's three or more loose stools a day for 24 to 48 hours. So mild to moderate C. diff infection. And in those people, the first thing you should think about doing is stopping the intercurrent antibiotics if you can. That's not always possible. Your patient may have endocarditis or osteomyelitis. But if you can, stop the antibiotic. It's a good idea. Metronidazole, as I mentioned, because of cost, has been recommended for over a decade as the primary treatment for these patients at this dose. And while I usually don't think there's a problem using antidiarrheal agents in people with infectious diarrhea, this is one of the few instances in which I think they should be avoided. The literature is not great, but I do think there's enough in the literature that it would be hard for you to stand up in court if your patient died and defend the use of an antiperistaltic. So medical legally, it's risky. However, more importantly, if you're giving an antidiarrheal, you're losing the parameter of following the diarrhea for the clinical response. So if you don't like the first reason, you can go at least like the second. What about severe C. difficile infection? So this, are the, this is the uh, simple diagnostic classification that we have offered for you for severe C. difficile infection. So it's hypoalbuminemia. Now this is hypoalbuminemia due to this illness, not in someone with cirrhosis or some other reason. And abdominal distension or tenderness and or an elevated white blood cell count greater than 15,000. So how did we come up with these criteria? Because I'll be honest, they have not been validated. Uh, most of the criteria for C. difficile have a pretty good negative predictive value, meaning if you don't have them, you're not going to be very sick. But 
a positive predictive value is much more difficult because you can have several of them and get better pretty quickly, or you can have several of them and die from, uh, from a, a, a perforation. There are at least eight different scoring systems that different institutions have developed to determine the severity of C. difficile. And they are looking at a variety of different clinical lab or x-ray criteria. This is a wonderful paper that Fujitani and colleagues did where they looked at all of these eight different scoring systems. And they then took their own patients and prospectively collected all of the data that's in all of these scoring systems for 184 patients. They then looked back and classified the patients as either non-severe or severe. And severity was defined as being in the ICU because of your C. diff infection, having to go to surgery for the C. diff infection, or dying within 30 days because of the C. diff infection. So I think those are pretty good criteria. I would classify that as severe. What they found was that none of these scoring systems was really very good when they applied them to determine the patients who would end up having severe disease. But they did find from their analysis that there were four criteria that did correlate well with severe C. diff infection. And those were abdominal distension, fever, in their case, a white count greater than 20,000, and that low albumin. So that's why we use three of these criteria to determine the severity, the hypoalbuminemia, the distension, and then we use a little bit of a lower cutoff rate for the white blood cell. So in these patients, I think you should start with vancomycin at a relatively low dose of 125 milligrams four times a day. If your patient doesn't get better, you can increase the vancomycin to 250 or 500 four times a day. There's no data to support this, but those of us who treated patients with C. diff have just seen an increase in dose has helped people who weren't getting better. Now, the final class is the severe and complicated disease, and those are the patients, obviously, that we're the most worried about. And uh, severe and complicated disease would be the patient who has to be in the ICU for their, severe, for their C. diff, hypotension, fever, ileus, a white count greater than 35 or less than 2, uh, elevated lactate, or any evidence of end organ failure, renal, or pulmonary. So these are our sickest patients. And in these patients, we should not only start with a much higher dose of vancomycin at 2 grams a day, but also add, e add IV metronidazole which can cross into the colon unit. If your patient does not have an ileus, it's good to continue enteral feeding. And the reason is that we presume that some of those carbohydrates are good for the microbiome uh, in the colon to help establish the normal flora. And if your patient has an ileus or a, or a toxic colon, you can give uh, vancomycin enemas by taking the IV form and putting it in some saline and putting it in the rectal tube at four times. There are a number of case reports uh, suggesting other treatments. Tigacycline IV is a different antibiotic, nidazoxanide orally, immune globulin, and fecal bacteriotherapy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in another context. So in summary, for mild to moderate C. diff infection, oral metronidazole. For severe C. diff infection, vancomycin 125 four times a day. And for severe and complicated C. diff infection, oral vancomycin at a higher dose, 2 grams a day. IV metronidazole, and consider adding vancomycin enemas in the appropriate setting. On rounds, it's important to, uh, to uh, look at and, and find out about the number of stools that the patient has, the consistency of the stools, whether or not there's a fever, what's the blood pressure doing, very importantly on exam is their abdominal distension. The laboratory parameters that we want to check would be white count, albumin, BUN, and creatinine, and maybe a lactate in the patients who are the severe uh, complications. And this then leads in this group, when do I get a surgery consult for my patient with C. diff? And this, like the uh, criteria for severe and complicated, can be a little subjective. And maybe all of those patients with severe and complicated, if they're not better in a day or two, should be seen by a surgeon. But let me go back a number of years to a patient uh, that, uh, that I had. He was actually on the surgery service, so he didn't need a surgery consult. But he's a good example of a patient who did well because of being on the surgery service. He had had a liver transplant. Actually, Erica Goldstein was one of your patients. Um, and she sent him for screening colonoscopy, and I found an adenocarcinoma at this clinic lecture, and uh, sent him for surgery. And preoperatively, his white count was 8,100, his albumin was 3.5, creatinine was 1.5, and he had a left hemicolectomy, 
And he did very well for his first few days after surgery. He was having some incisional pain, but he was up and walking around. But he hadn't passed any gas. And about on day five, when they were thinking about sending him home, his abdomen became markedly distended. He had a lot of pain. His white count went up to 18,000. The next day, his colon was dilated on a film. The, the transverse colon was like about 13 or 14 centimeters. He had more pain, more fever, more diarrhea. The white count went up to 24,000. The albumin dropped. Remember, that had been relatively normal. The creatinine rose. And this was an older case in the days when we were just testing for toxin A, and that was positive. And he was treated with oral vancomycin, IV metronidazole, but had more diarrhea, more colon distension, as you can see on his uh, flat plate, and went back to surgery, the criteria being that lack of response, the elevation of creatinine and white count, the dropping albumin, and he had a colectomy and an ileostomy. And he had a little bit of a rocky post-op course, but he eventually did well. His white count was almost normal at discharge, and he put his creatinine went back to baseline. So does the literature help us define the criteria for surgical intervention? This is a study from Quebec. And I mentioned that they had thousands of deaths from C. difficile because they had so many cases of terrible C. diff uh, at various hospitals in Quebec. And this is a series that the surgeons looked at of the patients who were in the ICU, really sick ICU patients. Now, this is a retrospective study, so it's always a little bit limited. But what's helpful is that they had a large number of really super sick C. diff patients to look at. So over this time frame, they had 161 patients. And the, their, their definition of fulminant was they were in the ICU because of their C. diff, or they would have been in the ICU for their C. diff because it was so bad if they weren't already there for some other reason. Um, or they died with it. And so then they looked at 30-day mortality. And of this group of 161 patients, 38 had surgery, and 123 were treated medically. And when they looked at those who had a surgery, of the 38 patients, the indications for surgery were persistent shock, non-response to medical treatment, megacolon, and perforation. That's a pretty clear one. And when they looked at overall mortality, the, the group treated medically, over half of them died, 58%. Whereas the group treated surgically had a lower mortality, 34%. Still pretty substantial, but less than the medical group. So then they went back to see what were the clinical criteria that determined the predictors of that 30-day mortality. And so those were an elevated lactate greater than 5, white count greater than 20, being on shock oppressors, and being over 75. And that's the group in whom the earlier colectomy seemed to give a survival benefit. So these are some of the criteria that we can use to think about when to call for a surgery consult. Not all of these, because I think what I would summarize and say, anybody with hypotension or shock, anyone who's septic, development of pulmonary or renal failure, a white count greater than 50 for sure. I don't think you have to wait for the white count to get to 50 to call the surgeons, but if it is 50, I would call them. An elevated lactate greater than 5 for sure, call the surgeons. Progressive abdominal tenderness or distension, and then if your patient is in that severe or complicated category, and they're not better after five days of maximum medical therapy, maybe it's time to call the surgeon. So one, one a challenge for surgeons as well as for us, and I do think that as internists, I think we work well with surgeons. They think differently than we do. And so in a patient like this, they may not be operating on the patient, but they often have very good insight and can make decisions together uh, about the, the appropriate treatment. But even they struggle with when should you operate? Because the markers of severity, as I mentioned, they're pretty good negative. If they're not there, your patient's not sick. But if they are there, it doesn't tell you is that patient going to need a colectomy or not. So uh, I can't give you a definite answer on when to operate, except call your surgeons and discuss and get their input. But definitely, the more negative predictors that the patient has, the more likely they are to benefit from an earlier colectomy. And obviously, you want to operate before the point of no return. So a colectomy has been the standard therapy. However, there is another option that makes this uh, more appealing for earlier surgery in the patients who are super sick, and that is this uh, loop ileostomy. So this is making an ileostomy so that the proximal contents can still be, uh, uh, so the proximal uh, food can still be digested by the small intestine, but then using the lower loop of that ileostomy to lavage the colon with a peg solution and vancomycin. And this is a study from Pittsburgh. They were able to do this laparoscopically in most of the patients. They were able to preserve the colon in most of the patients. 
they, 80% of the patients were hooked up. And Eric Van Eaton has done this in a case a couple months ago and tells me that his patient is doing well. Here were the results of that surgical series. This was uh, between uh, two, 2009 and 2011. They operated on 42 patients. And then they went back to look at their historical controls in another 42. And you can see in the traditional colectomy, the, uh, the uh, mortality was 50%. And in this salvage loop ileostomy group, the mortality was 20%. Still substantial, because these are very sick patients. But this might be uh, an option to consider. And then my final topic is, how do I treat patients with recurrent clostridium difficile infections? I'm going to tell you about a patient that I saw in 2004. And she was sent to me by an infectious disease doc. And she came with this history. She had uh, had her first son a number of years earlier. And she had a retained placenta and uh, was in the hospital for a long time. It was on antibiotics and had three episodes of C. difficile infection and was treated with metronidazole twice and then finally with vancomycin taper and saccharomycin boulardii and she got better. And if I had seen her at that time and she had asked me if she would get recurrent C. diff infection again, I would have said, no, I really don't think so. It's not likely. Once you get over that recurrent C. diff, you're not likely to get it again. However, I would have been wrong because she had another baby and 10 months after that, she had had diarrhea almost continuously. It would recur within a week. It was bloody. This is C. diff diarrhea. She hadn't been on any intercurrent antibiotics. She'd been pretty much continuously on vancomycin for almost nine months. They tried the fampin, they tried the taper, and it would still recur. Neither of the babies had uh, diarrhea. And so she saw me in GI clinic. And I'm going to discuss the different treatment options, but you might be thinking about what, what to do. So recurrent C. diff infection is recurrence of the infection and the symptoms within 30 or 60, depending on your criteria, of days of completing the treatment. The chance of having one recurrence is only 10 or 20 percent. But once you have that first recurrence, you're more likely to have continued recurrences. And then it goes up to 40 to 60 percent. And I've seen patients who have had recurrent C. diff infection not only for months, but in some instances even for years. Why does this happen? Well, there are two theories. One is it might be an impaired immune response. And there's some data from a small trial of patients with recurrent C. diff for those who had C. diff who got recurrences, had lower levels of IgG to toxin A. And in a vaccine study, the uh, resolution of recurrences was associated uh, with improvement in antitoxin B uh, antibodies. But I think the altered colonic microbiota is really the key. And here's a paper that I'm going to show you. It's a study of the microbiome in seven patients with C. diff infection and three controls. Now, for those not fascinated by the microbiome, most of our uh, gut uh, bacteria are in, uh, in two large groups, Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes. The three patients who developed C recurrent C. diff had a really much less diverse microbiota. And they also had other bacteria other than these two. And this is, I'll show you. So think of the holidays, the red and the green. Those are the good colors. So the green is the Bacteroidetes, the red is the Firmicutes. So these are the controls. And you can see they're mostly red and green. These are the people who had C. diff but didn't get recurrences. And again, mostly the red and the green. But these are the three people who got recurrent C. diff. So this one has only red, only Firmicutes with no Bacteroidetes. And this one has. Uh, uh, the Firmicutes, no Bacteroidetes, and these weird proteobacteria, sorry, I should say weird, and uh, weird colored bars. And then this patient has some Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes, but then has all its verrucal microbiome as well. So a really marked difference in the patients with the recurrent C. diff compared to the patients who didn't have C. diff or just had a single episode of C. diff and got better. So how do we treat? You do need to retreat with antibiotics, vancomycin or metronidazole. There is data that pulse and tapering decreases recurrences. I personally think that the pulse is more important than the tapering. And of course, you don't want to use metronidazole long term. Now, this is a vancomycin regimen that I'm very excited about because I've used it a number of times. Scott Curry is the infectious disease doc at the University of Pittsburgh who worked with us on our guidelines. And I got this regimen from him uh, last spring. And I used to do a much more long, involved vancomycin pulse regimen every other day for a week, every two days for a week, every three days for a week, every four days a week. And you can just imagine the calendar that extends out for about two months. 
So he proposed this regimen, which they had been using at Pittsburgh. I have had a couple of people in whom it has worked. I'm very excited about it. And it's relatively simple and not too expensive. And you don't have to print out a Google Calendar and write in all the doses for your patients. So it's basically 125 milligrams of vancomycin four times a day for 10 days. The next day, you just take a single vancomycin pill. You skip two days, a single vancomycin pill. Skip two days, and you do that five times, and you're done. And as I say, it hasn't worked in everybody that I've seen with recurrences over the last uh, nine months, but it's worked in a few, which is fantastic. Well, should we be looking at other antibiotics? I was very excited the first time the rifaximin chaser was uh, presented because it looked so simple and easy. And this was a number of years ago: two weeks of vancomycin, two weeks of rifaximin, decreasing recurrences, two small series. I called a patient in um, Arizona and recommended that to her and her doctor. It worked fantastic. I was very excited. It has never worked for me since. I have tried it maybe six or seven times, and I just have not found it to work. Fidaxomycin, remember, they didn't test fidaxomycin for recurrent C. diff, so there aren't any trials. And the FDA has not approved either of these drugs for this use. Well, we can't forget about the immune response. Uh, there are case reports of IVIG working for recurrences. There are a number of companies working on a vaccine. There was a vaccine published on three patients in which it got better. That was a number of years ago. I think that likely the vaccines are probably five years away at best. But very exciting is the oral monoclonal antibody to toxin A and B. And this was published in the New England Journal a couple of years ago where they gave it as an adjunct to antibiotics. And the people who already had recurrences, that's the group you want to study, the recurrent group, because they're more likely to keep recurring. The monoclonal antibody adjunct to antibiotics definitely decreased the recurrence rate. And Ajit Lamai has told me that next week they are opening a phase, uh, they're a site for the phase three trial of that project here. So a shameless plug to uh, recruit patients for him. Probiotics. Um, I worked with uh, uh, Gary Almer and Lynn McFarland, medicinal chemistry, and we looked at Saccharomyces boulardii. We studied that for about 14 years, looking at it for antibiotic-associated diarrhea and then for recurrent C. diff because it worked in the Hanson model, and that's basically how I got interested in C. diff. And in our first trial, it decreased recurrences by about 50%. But in our second trial, it only worked in a subgroup, the patients with high-dose vancomycin. We looked back to try to figure out why. We thought maybe it was because the vancomycin was better at decreasing the treated levels. You always want to be suspicious of any paper that has to look at subgroup analysis in order to find efficacy. Uh, so I just quite, uh, quite candid about that. But remember that probiotics are not completely benign. Uh, that you can get fungemia in immunosuppressed patients and in central lines, as Lardy has been found in the bloodstream of patients in the ICU. So you do want to use probiotics uh, cautiously. So what did we do with our patient? So I treated her the same way that I treated most patients. I gave a vancomycin taper in a pulse. I added the saccharomyces boulardii. I did that three times. Each time she recurred within a week. So finally, I went ahead with a stool transplant. I remember the day very vividly because um, the patient's husband was constipated, and so I scheduled her for a colonoscopy on Monday and Tuesday in case he wouldn't be able to deliver on Monday. But he dropped her off on Monday with this little desiccated stool sample. I have since become more savvy about how to have the donor prepare their uh, donation. And uh, I remember the fellow said she was sick that day, so she couldn't help me. Our nurses are in the union, so I couldn't ask them to mix up the stool. So I struggled with this little desiccated stool, got it into solution, did a colonoscopy, She's had no further recurrences, and in fact, I just saw her for her screening colonoscopy a couple months ago. This was the first time I actually did stool uh, a stool transplant. I had recommended it already previously, but recommended to other gastroenterologists so they could do it. But this patient, as I mentioned, came from infectious disease, so I had to do it myself. So a little quiz. When was stool transplant first documented? Now, those of you who have read the New York Times already know the answer to this, but I this slide I made a few days ago. Or was it in surgical patients in Denver, or was it on Gray's Anatomy in 2008? So 1,700 years ago, this is a letter to the editor that was a response to a paper uh, that we wrote on our long-term follow-up. And um, this Dr. Jang wrote back and said, should we be standardizing the 1,700-year-old fecal microbiome transplant? It was the first time that any of us uh, uh, working on this paper had seen that this had already been published and it was then in the New York Times they mentioned it today. So 1700 years ago and also in the fourth century, oral uh, administration of human stool 
diarrhea or dry desiccated stool has been used to treat patients with severe diarrhea with dramatic results. And in the, uh, in the uh, uh, 16th century, they called it yellow soup to make it more aesthetically pleasing. However, for those of you who are Grey's Anatomy fans, in the 2008 episode in the midnight hour, it was done um, in the emergency room. The patient came in. She had C, they thought she had C. diff. And uh, her husband was a donor, and uh, they did it by a nasogastric uh, route. So the idea of fecal enemas, and before knowing about the Chinese experience, the idea of fecal enemas actually goes back to 1958 from Denver, where a surgeon used uh, fecal enemas from either family members or surgery residents to treat pseudomembranous colitis with good results. Now remember, this was a post-op illness that was not even known to be C. diff. But another surgical series, again, using family members or surgery residents, treated 16 patients with severe C. diff and found that the patients got better as well. But the first use of fecal enemas to treat C. diff was in 1983. And then some Scandinavians used what I think is a more aesthetically appealing idea of a mi microbial mixture of 10 aerobic and anaerobic species and tr successfully treated six patients with C. diff, uh, recurrent C. diff. And when I used to talk in these days about C. diff, I said, well, fecal enemas, that's just a measure of how desperate patients and their doctors are. But as you now know, I became one of those desperate doctors. The year 2000 was the first report of using a colonoscope to uh, deliver stool to the right colon in a patient with a current C. diff. There are a couple of series of stool by NG tube. And then a, a, a small series of patients doing enemas at home because this, uh, <clears throat> this group uh, hospital wouldn't allow them to do stool transplants, so they had to figure out, let their patients figure it out at all. So what about the terminology? Stool transplant, I have to be honest, that's what I tend to say. Fecal bacteria therapy, fecal enemas. When I published uh, with Neil Stolman our small series of patients, we came up with the term fecal flora reconstitution. But this is not a good term anymore, because the microbiologists tell us, fecal, that's OK. But it's not flora, that's plants. So it's microbiota. And we're not actually reconstituting the stool. We're actually transplanting. So those of us on a fecal microbiota transplant group spent about an hour and a half on a conference call and came up with this terminology. But honestly, I still say stool transplant. In a systematic review of a number of small case series and case reports, there was a 92% success rate of fecal microbiota transplant. 89% after one treatment, 5% after retreatment. The response rate was a little bit lower with the NG root. In my experience of treating 36 patients, one patient recurred because she had had antibiotics and she was then treated with probiotics and resolved. I've had to re-transplant two people who recurred with that first transplant and used a different donor. And both of them, they, these were uh, older women, or middle-aged middle or older women, they both recurred after transplants done with stool from their daughters, and they both were successfully retransplanted with stools from their sons. But it's an N of two, so who knows. I have treated two patients with inflammatory bowel disease. I got rid of their C. diff. It didn't make their IBD any better. And two patients I treated with enemas alone. So I haven't had anybody who still has a C. diff. The patient who I treated three weeks ago sent me this card. <laughs> And when I called her up to thank her and tell her I was going to be putting into this talk, she said, oh, good, I'm glad you got it. <laughs> Not that I got the card, but that I understood the joke. So why does it work? It works because the microbiota before the transplant is really abnormal, as I showed you. There's not enough bacteroidetes. And after the transplant, the stool resembles that of the donor. And Alex Koritz in Minneapolis did a nice study on this one patient showing an absence of bacteroidetes in those weird atypical populations before the transplant. Two weeks after and up to a month after, these, the patient's stool resembled the donor stool, and there was a lot more bacteroidetes there. But obviously, those are some good guys. So this is my uh, small stool transplant uh, club, where we decided, those of us who have been doing stool transplant for a number of years, we decided that we would send a survey to all of our patients to find out if there were any long-term sequelae that we might not know about. And so this is uh, uh, Lawrence Grant in, in, at Einstein, Colleen Kelly, Mark Mello at Oklahoma, Neil Stolman uh, at Oakland, and myself. So we sent a survey that we developed 
And of about 94 patients, 77 returned the survey. Interestingly, in our experience, it's more common in women, and I don't know why that is. The patients had had an average of five recurrences, had been sick for an average of 11 months, and ranged in age from 22 to 88, although most of them were, uh, were older. And the results were very dramatic. Within six days, people's symptoms were gone. 91% were cured with that transplant of the seven failures. Some were retransplanted. And then four of the patients actually then were just retreated with antibiotics and got better, whereas that hadn't been effective before. But there are a lot of unanswered questions. Does it really work? Well, a study published yesterday from the Netherlands in the New England Journal of Medicine showed Actually, it does work. So this is the first controlled trial, randomized controlled trial. It's not blinded, as you can see, but it is a randomized controlled trial. So they tested three different regimens. This is very exciting. They tested vancomycin two grams a day for 14 days. That's a pretty standard regimen. They tested vancomycin two grams a day for four days, and then a gut lavage, and then vancomycin two grams a day for four days, and a gut lavage, and then they administered donutesi by nasal duodenal tube. They had to, I had to, actually had to stop the study early because the results were so dramatic. Vancomycin alone, a 31% recurrence rate. Vancomycin and gut lavage, 23% recurrence rate. But vancomycin with gut lavage and donor stool, 81%, had no further recurrences. And two of the three responded to a second infusion. And then many of the patients in these control groups asked to have the duodenal infusion, and most of those responded as well. So 81% uh, response, I think I said that backwards, 31% recurred, 23% didn't recur, 81% no recurred. So um, is colonoscopy better? Obviously, I would prefer the colonoscopic route because you go to Midas, you get a muffler, I do colonoscopy. Um, the, uh, um, we may have the answer to this uh, shortly. The NIH has funded a randomized control trial that Colleen Kelly and Larry Brandt are doing. And the control group of patients get the colonoscopy with their own stool. And they've enrolled four patients so far. Is it safe? Uh, who's the donor? Is, who pays for the donor's labs? How do we screen the donor? Is frozen stool OK? That's what they do in Minneapolis. And the bonus of frozen stool is it doesn't smell bad anymore. Um, should we have a donor bank? Should we have a, a donor pool? Are there other alternatives? In my opinion, if we're still doing stool transplant in five years, the scientists will have failed us because we should be able to identify and culture the essential good bacteria. And that's what they've done in Canada. They just published last week the repopulation study. So, <laughs> so uh, Elaine Petroff has been working with a microbiologist they took a 41-year-old healthy woman, and they isolated a lot of different strains of bacteria from her. And then they made a synthetic stool and administered by colonoscopy. And two patients were successfully treated with six months of follow-up and are doing well. So to summarize treatment for recurrences, for the first recurrence, you can just give the same antibiotic that you gave before. For the second recurrence, I think I'd like you to try that vancomycin pulse regimen. I'm very excited about it. For the third recurrence, Maybe uh, enroll in the study that's uh, starting on the monoclonal antibody, or maybe consider fecal microbiome transplant. So in summary, I think that PCR for toxin B is going to be the new gold standard for laboratory diagnosis of C. diff. We've reviewed treatment for mild to moderate disease. Oral metronidazole is still fine. You do not want to give that early in pregnancy because of the eugenicity. But other than that, it's fine. For severe disease, think of vancomycin. For severe and complicated disease, vancomycin and IV metronidazole and consider surgery consult, and recurrent C. diff is still a treatment challenge. Thank you very much for your attention.